our journey begins in the small coastal foggy town of Jonesport, Maine. We arrive here late afternoon and set up. This is a privately owned campground nestled right on the coast. Jonesport is a lobster and fishing community located about an hour south of the Canadian border. The fog is eerie, but it makes this landscape so much more dynamic. My wife, Renee, is joining us on this trip, along with our pups, Nora and Bibby. We'll be cruising through Newfoundland in our 2021 Jeep Gladiator Sport S and our Xventure XV3 trailer. Being on the coast of the colder North Atlantic is getting me really excited. Four years ago when we came through Nova Scotia, it was one of the best trips we had taken thus far. Tomorrow we cross into Canada and begin our overland journey through Newfoundland. From our home in Kentucky, this is going to start with an 1860 mile trek into New Brunswick, Canada, through Nova Scotia, and then a ferry crossing of the Atlantic. This trip will be our biggest undertaking yet. We're able to do this trip with amazing partners like Xventure Trailers and Red Arc Electronics. And supported by PowerTube TV and Rugged Bound Supply Company. We woke up to an even foggier morning and got on the road early. Our first stop was Lubeck, Maine. Lubeck sits right on the Canadian border. This little town is the country's closest continental location to Africa. It has a rich history in the fishing industry and is what I would picture any small main town to look like from back in the day. We parked it on Main Street and waited for the only restaurant to open for breakfast downtown, a little place called Narrow Scape, and would you know it? It had lobster on the breakfast menu. If you watched our Nova Scotia series, you'd know I'm mildly obsessed with lobster. After breakfast, we headed towards the border. A quick bridge crossing onto Campobello Island in Yoren, Canada. Only thing left to do is actually make it into the country through customs. With a few occupation questions and where we're going, we were through. Changed our speedometer to kilometers and headed towards our first ferry. Our first ferry connects Campobello Island over to Deer Island. The Hopper 2 ferry was privately run, and with the trailer, the ferry ride cost around 43 bucks. It's about 3.1 miles across, and it takes about 20 to 25 minutes. For some reason, I loved that you just drove out onto the beach. It's only a nine mile drive from one side of Deer Island to the other where we would hit our second ferry of the morning. This ferry was run by the local government, so it didn't cost us a thing to use it. This ferry connects Deer Island over to the mainland of New Brunswick, and it's only about 3.3 miles. The Deer Island Princess 2 was a little bit faster than the previous ferry, and it wove in and out of beautiful Maine islands. The thing I love about both these ferries is you can get out, walk around, and get all the pictures you want.
After arriving New Brunswick, we shot up the coast to the big city of St. John. It was lunchtime, so we stopped at Big Tide Brewing Company for some food and a local brew. Had an amazing sour beer, a burger, and Renee had some breakfast. It was time to hit our first camp spot in Canada, located on the Bay of Fundy. We aired down a little bit, turned our shocks to soft, and changed our Red Arc Topro Elite brake controller over to off-road mode. We had 10 to 15 miles of rough gravel and a little bit of off-roading to get to the Bay of Fundy, and we are looking forward to seeing some beautiful New Brunswick backcountry. Bay of Fundy has the highest tidal change in the world, which means the coasts are going to be pretty dynamic in their looks and how they've been carved out by the waves. We've wanted to camp on the Bay of Fundy again since we were up here last time, and through guidance of a local friend, we found the spot of a lifetime. The weather was perfect and I was looking forward to just having a relaxing afternoon since we made it here around 4.30 p.m. With the dogs eating their dinner, it gave me plenty of opportunity to make Renee and I a sandwich and upload some footage. The rest of the afternoon was spent relaxing, hiking, and just taking in the sounds of the waves. A quick marriage slash camping tip, give each other some space. I stuck down and had a beverage while Renee went up to the tent to go to bed early with the pups. The day ended with a perfect sunset. The next morning started with a decent hill climb with some rock crawling out of the bay, followed by a four hour drive to get into Nova Scotia. To gain access from the southern part of Nova Scotia to the northern part, you cross over the Conso Causeway. Once over the land bridge, you've crossed over onto Cape Breton Island. We didn't have to be anywhere till 9 p.m., so I was on a mission to get a lobster roll. 
After some Googling, we found one in Badek. This place is a little slice of heaven. Between the paddleboarding, the sailboats, and the kayaking, this place was the perfect little water town. Right on the boardwalk is the freight shed. And what do you know, one of the best lobster rolls I've had in years. 10 out of 10. The last stop of the day was Sydney Harbor. We took our time stopping along the way to reminisce on our Nova Scotia trip we took four years ago. Once in North Sydney Port, we could see the enormous ferry taking us to Newfoundland called the Blue Patis. This monster can haul up to 550 cars. You're supposed to arrive two hours early before departure. We arrived at port at 9 p.m., went through check-in, and parked in the long line waiting to board. Being there early allowed us to check over all of our gear, run through systems, and get everything packed for our short night on the ferry. Right at 10.45 on the dock, we were signaled to head towards the front of the boat where we entered through a massive door with hydraulic arms into the bows of the ship. The sheer scale of this thing was impressive. When I say this was chaotic, it was a madhouse dash for people to get on board and find seating where they would be sleeping the rest of the night. About six months ago, I went ahead and booked a pet-friendly cabin for us to get some good night's sleep. It was very compact, but worth every dime. It was a unique experience to take a stroll around the boat while everything was shut down. We had launched and we are on our way to Newfoundland. 110 miles and 8 hours later, we saw our first glimpses of land. After an intercom announcement to head back to our vehicles that almost scared the life out of me it was so loud, we made our way through a maze of campers, semis, and vehicles back to our truck and departed the ferry. After four days of long travel, we finally arrived in Newfoundland and Port of Basque. A little bit to our disappointment, Newfoundland was as covered in fog as mainland New Brunswick. We couldn't help but wonder, would this weather be what the rest of our trip looked like? It's time to start our trip. Just out of town, the fog raised to a low cloud, and we got our first glimpse of the Long Range Mountains region. mountains form the most northern section of the Appalachia mountain chain on the eastern seaboard of North America. A short drive up the western coast, we headed into Stephenville to a little brewery called Secret Cove Brewing. seen a little bit of a pattern with all of the sours on tap. So of course we had to try the local fare. We even met some local travelers from New York State who had been up here for a few weeks already.
heading out and up onto the westernmost peninsula, our destination was a little pen strip of land that had a few different names, Blue Beach, Long Point, and as the locals like to call it, the bar. This 14 mile long, unique strip of land didn't look like it got any wider than a mile, had beaches on one side and cliffs on the other. And at the very point has a small town that doesn't have any year round residents that houses fishing boats and beautifully maintained little fishing homes. After stalking to talk to an awesome little family having a lobster broil, we headed back down towards where we're going to hopefully camp for the night. Most of this drive was a beautiful clear day, but something unique happened. As soon as we hit the town of mainland, the mountains that overlooked the town had a waterfall of clouds coming over to the ocean. It was apparent we'd be driving directly into them. And under a quarter mile, we couldn't see more than a few hundred feet in front of us. This goes to show you how fast a North Atlantic weather can change. Our goal was to camp at the St. George Cape Point which was supposed to have beautiful views, but after a little bit of overcrowding, we decided to move on to our secondary backup camp. Headed back inland, we went to the Piccadilly Head Provincial Park. With potential rain in the forecast, we put the awning out. About 30 seconds later, we had 120 square feet of freestanding coverage. This private little provincial park was family ran, cost us just $6 to camp, and had a family of three wild fox. We eat cheap when we're at camp, so we can afford to have really nice meals when we want them. It's hot dogs for dinner. go by the rule, buy once, cry once. So a few pieces of essential gear that we like is this stainless steel Snowmaster fridge that we can leave in the back of the truck, a good power system to control and power that, a good way to keep the bugs away like this thermocell, and for heat, we love the lava box. We typically time our drives to where we can arrive at camp between 4 and 5 p.m which gives us plenty of time to wind down and just chill out and reflect on the day. It's time to head up to the Northern Peninsula area. And to our immense joy, we started the day with clear skies. Driving through this area reminds us of the eastern part of Kentucky and Tennessee. Mid-morning, we arrived in the Gross Moor National Park of Canada. The 
The main drive through the park is littered with pull-offs and scenic views. Forty minutes into the park, we stopped at Southeast Brook Falls for a hike through some old forest. The tannin in these waters remind us of the Manganese Falls in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I think the pups were tuckered after that little hike. The mountains that come in and out of the park remind me of something I saw from Braveheart, like Scottish Highlands. For most of the day up the peninsula, the mountains are to the east, while the coast is to the west. The roads are amazing and the views are spectacular. One stop up the coast that you just can't miss is Arches Rock. What used to be four sea caves is now three that have been carved into a small rock island. We were amazed by how cold and how clear the water is here. Having made it to the northern area of the peninsula, we are able to catch the St. Barb Ferry heading toward Maidenland, Labrador, which is only an hour and 45 minute ride. Another tip is study your maps. We found two or three beautiful little offshoots from the highway that go along the coast and give you some views that most people just won't see. At the top of the peninsula, we start getting into the northern barren lands. And once we reach this area, we notice some strange things bordering the road. 20 by 20 small gardens. When we stopped for gas, we asked one of the locals, and he called it eminent domain gardening. Families will plant the same little garden space each year and eventually it becomes theirs, even though it's owned by the Providence. The reason they plant next to the road is when they made these roads, they turned over the land enough to bring enough fertile soil to the surface. At the very top of the peninsula, the furthest north you can take a vehicle is Cape Norman. This area is a barren limestone headland. All around you are what looks like some ancient lava flows. It's such an alien looking landscape.
as we turn the corner to our final destination. Like a spotlight from the heavens, a single sun spire pierced through the sky behind the Cape Norman Lighthouse. Besides the unholy plague of pterodactyl-sized mosquitoes that seem to fight all physics and fly in the wind to get you, you couldn't help feel, but these are the places that we overland for. Surrounded by limestone shelf rock and churning green and blue oceans, these are the landscapes that I will always remember. The lighthouse was first lit in 1871 and featured a steam-powered foghorn. The station was later automated in 1992. It's also up here at this northern point where we got our first glimpse at an iceberg. And just as we set up camp about to go to bed, the fog rolled out the clouds parted, the sun came out, and we got a glimpse at why they call this area the Barren Straits of Bell Island.